This is a little bit of a different introduction to the podcast, but because of my conversation with Kale Burke, that I just had, it was phenomenal. It was an absolutely great conversation. It reminded me of a blog post that I wrote uh, and it's titled, What Will It Look Like When We Arrive? And I just want to read you a portion and want you to keep it in your mind as uh, you're listening to the podcast with Kale today. And here's what I say. And this is just part of it. You can read the whole blog post in the link down below. I've been asking school districts lately, if you are successful in achieving your vision, what would that look like for your students and your community? For example, I've seen schools and districts share in their vision something similar to all students will be college and career ready. Maybe not in those exact words, but at least something to that effect. So if that is the vision, are these schools following students after they leave grade 12 to know if they have achieved that or not? Is this a vision that has only nice words with no follow-up? Could a student fail at a school, but also be college and career ready? Could a student graduate school and also not be in that vision? The critical question is, if we're successful in our mission and vision, what would that look like for community in tangible measures? The word tangible is bold because I struggled with what was missing in the sentence. So I looked up the definition of tangible and here's what I found. It, it is clear enough or definite enough to be easily seen, felt, or noticed. Simply put, here are three questions an organization should be able to ask and answer. Where do we wanna go? How will we get there? And what will it look like when we arrive? These questions are essential at the district, classroom, and school levels. And maybe the answer to the third question, the third question is a constantly moving target. When learning is the goal, how do we ever get to an endpoint? Tough question, but still one that is necessary to consider. Today's podcast, when I was talking to Kale, one of his big focuses is impact before action. What is the impact that we want to have? What is the tangible thing that we want to see because of the work that we're doing? And he has such a great way of explaining these concepts and what this looks like because too often we have these big grandiose visions, but there's a disconnect between administration and what's actually happening in the classroom. And so starting with what is the impact of the work that we do in our classrooms and how do we get there is a really powerful question. You're going to love this podcast. I really enjoyed connecting with Kale today. I, I so appreciate your time, your willingness to learn with me, but welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. Hey everyone, this is George Kroos. Welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. Today, I have my friend Kale Burke, who lives in British Columbia, Canada. And we were just talking about Celsius and Fahrenheit. And even though I'm in Florida, I have not, I have not converted. If someone says like it's 80 degrees, I'm like, I don't know what that means yet. So I'm still trying to figure out the easy formula. But it's always nice to talk to you know some of my fellow Canadian friends. And uh, Kale has done some incredible work. He is a brilliant mind in education. He does a lot of great stuff with, with leadership. And he actually has a new book out called Navigating Leadership Drift, Observable Impact on Rigorous Learning. And I'm excited to talk to you more about that. But Kale, if you could just kind of introduce yourself, tell us who you are, what you do today and how you got there. It's a great place to start. So I want to go back to the Celsius and Fahrenheit. <laughs> I do. I saw you. I saw a little twinkle in your eyes. And said it. I have Are it on the plus away? side. So I have okay. it on the plus side, the sort of double it and add 32, but it's going the other way, the negative. It just messes me up. <laughs> and because we're always so cold up here, I just have no way of, of doing that. So no, thanks for, for having me, George. It's exciting to be here today. I, I guess I'm a recovering principal. Uh, that's what I always say. And I, I just, I want to apologize to all the teachers that I worked with in the past i i loved shiny objects and new things and and i think that's where george and i connected was yeah. really about innovation and 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 trying new things and and i i was lucky enough to be a teacher and a principal a high school principal for a number of years a district head of innovation um for a number of years as well and and then you know what i I was having a, a conversation totally serendipitous with Dylan William on a deck in Wisconsin. And I asked him about writing books and I said, how do you write it? And he said, you know, when you're mad enough, the words just come. <laughs> and I think that's probably fueled a lot. So when I, I wrote my first book about change, it was called changing change using learner centered mm -hmm. design. I was just frustrated 
with the process of change in schools. When I wrote PLC 2.0, I was frustrated with the amount of time and energy and resources that people were putting into to collaboration without having any impact. And then with, with Drift, it was really about, I'm frustrated with how, how difficult the leadership position has become for folks mm -hmm. in a post COVID era. So, so that's kind of what's, what's taken me out of uh, a district position to do this uh, a little bit more full time and to bring me to a, a great podcast like this one today. Well, you know, it's funny. Cause I, like once you start writing and maybe for some people, this would be sharing on Instagram, like through video, you know, maybe podcasting do whatever. I find that once you kind of get into that space, that when ideas frustrate you, if you don't write them down, if you don't, it, like they just kind of, they're on your mind all the time. And there's actually, a, I've, I've, I still have it. There's a post I wrote um, in, oh, it was maybe 2010. And I was sitting at a leadership conference and just so frustrated with what they were saying. And I was so mad. And I like blasted everybody. And it was like, <laughs> if you don't change, you're going to become irrelevant and like we're education is going to die and stuff like this. And I actually kept that on the post because my intent was really, really good. Right. To, in what they're saying, but, and I, I I've talked about this in the sense that everyone who agreed with me at the time probably cheered me on and everyone that disagreed with me and my belief at that time, the way that I wrote that post probably push them further away. Like that's something. And so I've kept that and I've like revisited that post. And I said, here's why, here's what I agree with in the, in the sentiment. Here's what I don't like in the delivery. So when you actually feel that frustration, how do you, how do you kind of, I don't know, edit it in a way that you are actually helping the people that are furthest away from your ideas. I think that's kind of what I'm, cause that's the first thing I thought of. Cause I know, when you write frustrated, you can actually push people away and, you know, you want to kind of help solve a problem, but you're not solving a problem by pushing the people away that need the solution. Well, I think part of it in the, in the writing process is it, it serves as, as the initial fuel, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so when, so when, when we're sort of fired up about something, but then to me, it's almost taking people on the hero's journey. Mm -hmm. And and you're sort of uh, trying to draw people in right off the bat, and and yeah. and sort of help them feel that that passion in the pit of their stomach, and and almost take them down into the pit with you. But then it's slowly, how do we come out and sort of give ourselves hope? And I think that's what the 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 sort of fuel the initial um, ignition. And I, and what you said really resonates with me because I think that's something over the span of now that I'm I'm just about 52 here that I've had to learn a lot is is the message it can push people a long ways away and how do you find that sort of middle ground so the passion is a good place to start but I think then the process needs to come right very quickly after which is okay we've stated the problem how do we work towards solutions and I think that's how you can really temper some of that great passion and fire but turn it into something where people go yeah okay it sounds like we have a chance because you're right George if if our there's so much polarization that's happening right now yeah I think we all need uh, a little bit more of that middle ground and I think part of it is and I and I know you're a big believer in this too is is that human centered approach where we're doing the ethnography and really trying to understand, I wonder why someone might think differently than me. And, and I think that's a real way in our writing, in our blog posts, in all those things in our Twitter posts is being uh, to me authentically curious about what people are actually thinking and why. And if we did more of that, I think in education, I think we could move yeah. a lot quicker. That's just my opinion. Well, the, the, the argument I make all the time with people is that, you know, where you're at today in your beliefs and you wishing everyone was there too, somebody was patiently waiting for you to get to that point as well. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the stuff that I became like this huge advocate for, you know, uh, years ago, people were like, why aren't you doing this? I'm like, leave me alone. Like, I'm, you know, and you, you, for me, it's always the best way to kind of help people move forward is kind of point to yourself when you actually had that, those same struggles and kind of understand that, that process, you know, you had mentioned something, you know, about your principalship and it's, it's curious because I felt what you said when I was a principal, you, you get really excited about innovation. You get excited about all the possibilities, 
that you may have gone too fast and, you know, maybe the same thing kind of push people away. So if you could go back to like, we asked this question on the last podcast and that one will be linked down below is like, what advice did you give to your first year teacher self? I'm actually curious, like if you can go back to your principalship, what, like, what advice would you give to yourself that, you know, things that you would have done differently at that time? Because I'm sure you are a great principal, but there's always things I look back on stuff that I did and I was really proud of my time in that role. But there's tons of stuff I'd be like, yeah, I should have done this, this way, this way, you know, I'd say it's 2020. So like, if you go back to your principalship, like how would you maybe approach things a little bit different, you know, with all the knowledge that you have today? What a great question. And I think, you know, the, the one thing that I would really think about for myself going back in time is, is I was so focused on being a leader in action and doing mm -hmm. stuff and, and, and trying to make things better and help people. And, and I wasn't as focused, uh, on impact. And I, I mean, that's a big thrust of the book. That's a big thrust mm -hmm. of, of PLC 2.0 is leadership is not about what leaders look like. There are so many books out there about the leader needs to be flexible and courageous and all these sorts of things, <clears throat> excuse me. And, and I find that that's a bit wrong headed. Mm -hmm. um, it, for me, leadership is what it leads to. And so if, you know, any leader is going to say, I make great relationships with my staff. And the question that, that I like to push people's thinking on is, is if we made great relationships with our staff, what would we actually observe them doing as a result of that? Mm -hmm. And that's a different question because everyone can say, I build relationships. I am courageous. I have an open mind. If you had an open mind as a leader, what would be the impact? In other words, what would you see from those that you lead and what would you see in the classroom? So I think the thing that I would go back on now, and this is sort of what I do now, is, is really have leaders focus on what's the impact that you hope to observe? And then what are the leadership activities, the leadership styles that you need to start to adopt to make that happen at a higher frequency? So focusing on impact first and then action second would be something that I'd do. Well, the, that's, you know, I was thinking about that, you know, when you're giving that response, when I ask teachers, like, I always do this, like, Hey, like, tell me about your principal. Oh, they're so nice. They let me do whatever I want. <laughs> I'm like, is that a good principal? You know, it, cause it's not, and I, I understand. And there's this, there's this delicate balance of that, you know, like you got to trust me to have some autonomy in the things I'm doing, but I've talked about this a ton if that leader is not actually helping you grow and get better, then what is the benefit? And like, what do you, what do you, when you hear that, like, what do you think when somebody would say that to you? Cause that kind of throws me off a little bit. I'm like, I don't know if that's really a great principle because you can do whatever you want, but what, what is whatever you want look like, I guess. Oh, see. And, and there you just hit it right at the end for me, George, which mm -hmm. is, I, I think the good leader co is their friend co-create co-design they're always doing p things with rather than for people and and so when 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 people talk about the sort of doing whatever i want i always wonder so what is our co-created observable vision of what teaching and learning looks like in the classroom because then we now have a common lexicon a common language for us to be able to discuss what's happening in the, in the classroom because a good principal and i, I referred to marty lewis uh, in our earlier uh, session together mm. Marty's gift was also, and I think the number one thing that leaders need to do is to be able to confront and interrogate practice, whether it's our assessment practices, our teaching practices, our leadership practices, our practices with community engagement. Are we willing to actually confront those through the lens of what's the impact that they're having? So when, you know, the idea of having someone allow us do whatever we want, I think that's, you know, kind of interesting in the short term, isn't it? But in the long term, as you say, right. it's sort of like walking through the desert after a while. There's no parameters, no walls. We don't actually know where we're going because we don't know where we've been. So I think that idea of creating that common vision with our staff and with teachers really empowers them to start to deal, uh, to, to get into that. I know where I'm at. I know where I've been. And that's the efficacy piece that we're all sort of chasing around like the, by, like the Holy Grail right now. Yeah. And this, this ties like we were kind of, you know, we were just kind of prepping for the show here today. You are, I know you do a lot of work with like strategic plans with school districts and kind of helping them through that. How, how does that, what you're saying right now, like, how do you kind of help them to do that? Because I, you know, when I'm thinking about some of the strategic plans, the, the, the vision and stuff like that, it's, it's not what you're saying. 
right? But like, how do you get them there? Oh, I'm laughing because this is this is the 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 best part of it all, isn't it? Strategic plans. Uh, so I, we and right. you do this too, George. But you'll ask a crowd of people. You have you know a few people with you, and you'll say, okay, let's let's rank these five things right. in terms of their impact. So let's go staff meetings collaborative time, professional development days, school improvement plans, and district strategic plans. And mm -hmm. you'll ask people, rank these from one to five in terms of impact. And it, it, strategic plans don't even come in at five, do they? Right. They come at like nine. Right. People are saying, is there a lower level of it? Like, right. So right. what's interesting is, is that we spend a lot of time on strategic planning and it's, uh, we spend resources. Sometimes we bring consultants in, but in the end, they tend not to lead to a whole lot. So one of the things that, you know, when we're doing strategic planning that I love to start with is, is if we are doing strategic planning, what would we see at the classroom level? In other words, for example, one thing we might see is that teachers would be designing and implementing tasks, strategies that are rooted in the strategic plan. So what we really want to say is our indicator of success is not having a strategic plan. Our indicators of success is that people actually use the strategic plan and we can see it in the classroom. So where I really like to start is, is what would we uh, see in the classroom as a result? And and work outwards from there. So sort of what's the S1, the student sort of output, what's the educator output, and then what's the leader output, and what's the district leader output so that we have a direct line of sight from board boardroom to classroom. That's really the, the philosophy that I like to think, because otherwise, as we know, like vision statements, they're they're written by a few, read by a few, right. and inspire even less. Right. And, and anyone who has a civilian, someone outside of education as a significant other or friend, they just look <laughs> at the language that we right. use, and they just say, what, what are you talking about? Like, we don't even understand what those things mean. And I think we have to get back to the grassroots of what we would actually observe in the classroom as a result of our plans. So that's where I start with, with strategic planning. So I'm kind of in the midst of speaking to school districts and, you know, doing their opening days and things like this. And a lot of times, and I get them off of this, they'll say like, Hey, before you come here, can you like look at our strategic plan? We really want you to kind of in implement that in your talk and have this. I said, nah, I'm actually not going to do that because I don't know if your staff knows the strategic plan. So they're gonna be like, what is this guy even talking about? So what I'm going to build on is what I hear in the day. So I want you to talk about some of those visions, some of the things that you're trying to do, because then I know what, what has actually been heard in the room, but you just kind of, like you said, it, it, sometimes it feels more of a, a PR thing than it right. is actually a, like, this is going to benefit kids in the classrooms. And I, I'm curious about, um, I, I want you to kind of go into this a little bit more because I remember writing a blog post. It was not that long ago. And it was basically saying like the, the initiative that you have, can you actually articulate it in a way of what it would look like in a classroom yeah. if you were successful? Like they talk about this, you know, these, these big kind of focuses. But then if I say like, if you're actually successful at this, can you identify that? Like give some vision to that. And I don't think many that can, that can happen in many school districts. I don't know if that's something you're seeing because it's like, Hey, we want this. Okay. What does that look like in the classroom? And it's like, Oh, I, you know, I don't know about that. I don't know that. And I'm like, well, that's kind of where you need to go. Well, I think, you know, you said something earlier I, uh, that's, that's really germane here. And that is, this is where the, the I think the key role of the principal starts to kick in mm -hmm. is we do have a district vision or strategic plan, whatever it is. And in truth, most strategic plans have lots of good ideas in them. They're, they're, they're just, they're sort of aspirational, right? So the question becomes, how do we grab that aspirational idea and bring it down right into the classroom? And so I think a, a really useful way to do that is, is even as a school principal to look at some of those strategic plans and say, okay, let's say, for example, that one of our, our strategic plan priorities was inclusion, just to use that right. as an example. Yeah. To then go back to our staff and say, folks, if we were, you know, doing in quotes inclusion at the highest level of proficiency, what would our students be doing and demonstrating as a result? And having our staff start to think about, hmm, like, what would it look like? And the key is, is that when we start to make our staff's unique thinking observable, it actually tells us as leaders what we need to do next. Because let's say, for example, that our staff starts to kind of struggle with, hmm, I wonder what inclusion would look like in the classroom. This is a great press pause point for the leader to say, wow, 
we actually have some professional learning that we need to do about this right. before we start charging after the next initiative, which is what I would have done as a principal back in the day. Right. Right. We might have to press pause and say, what's the learning that we need to do next so that we can start to have a common language around inclusion? So I think this is where I like to use a lot of tools and protocols that actually make adult thinking observable so that leaders know what it is that we need to do next. And by doing that, I think that we can take that sort of lofty aspirational um, district vision and we can actually concretize it in the classroom by having people start to envision this is what students would look like this is what the educators would be doing and this is what would be the types of tasks activities and assessments you know so if you say to people hey we're working on inclusion interesting so we if we were doing inclusion at the highest level what would an assessment look like that was right. truly inclusive and you know then you might see people go oh i'm not sure great we should probably learn more about that. And I think that's that pivotal role of the principal that can really be that connector from taking the stuff from the district level and bringing it right down to the classroom. Yeah, I think I, you know, I'm, I'm sure you agree with this too. It's not about the necessarily the administrator like totally articulating what it looks like for the classroom, especially if they have not like taught in the classroom for a while. It's actually having those conversations, I think is a really crucial part because you know some of the the vision that is had um, by administrators doesn't trans translate into the classroom, and there's that's where a lot of the disconnect happens. Um, I actually remember, and I, I kind of feel I, I don't know if I feel better or worse now that I wrote this, but uh, in interviewers' mindset, I wrote one of the things I wrote about was eight things to look for in today's classroom. So I talked about very like, hey, these are kind of the things that we should be seeing in these classrooms as observable things. So it's not like innovation as this far out unachievable thing but it's something that you understand it's you know and as you said is kind of making an impact uh on the classroom and i i just i love that you're saying this because uh i see this a lot of this vision strategic planning this mission stuff and it's so not concrete right like it's just I, like i don't even know if the people sharing the vision sometimes could actually say, here's what it actually would look like in a classroom. And, 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 and like, or, or even are considering having the conversation. Well, and it's funny because this is the, the approach now that I take with, with superintendents and districts with strategic planning is that we need to start with that. And, and those plans now look very different uh, than other plans that I've seen because they start with literally our priorities are, let's say, their um, inclusion, engagement, uh, right. critical thinking, whatever. The first thing that we have to do is we have to define with, not for teachers, right. because boy, oh boy, I sure don't know what a classroom looks like because I haven't been in there for such yeah. a long time as much as I work with teachers all the time. Yeah. But when we sit with a group of teachers and we start to develop that common set of look fors, and it can't be the Dead Sea Scrolls, it can't be 50 things, it needs mm -hmm. to be three or four things that if critical thinking were done really well in our classroom, mm -hmm. these are the three or four things that we would see. But then that's just the easy part. That's what we want kids to do. The question becomes, if we want those four things to happen at a higher frequency, what would adults need to do to make that happen at a higher frequency? It's kind of like I look at PBIS. PBIS to me is one dimensional. It says what students should be doing. And I always smile at that and go, well, that's the easy part. Of course we want students to behave and be kind and all this stuff. The question becomes, what are the teachings that we need to put in place? So a PBIS matrix should have three dimensions to it, which is student, educator, and task. But too frequently, you're right. <clears throat> we stop at the sort of the I can statements for students. Why don't we have I can statements for adults? And that's what I really like to work with districts to think about is if we want these statements for students, then right behind it, we have to have, and this is what adults would do to make that happen at a higher frequency. Otherwise, as you said, these things drift around in the ether and we don't really actually know what they mean. So I really like to get down to the concrete sort of show me, tell me what this would look like in a classroom. It's hard, but as you said, it's the right work to do. Otherwise, it just floats off until the next cycle goes through, doesn't it? You know, so like, I, I know we talked on the last podcast, like we connected on Twitter very, very early, like a long, long time ago. And I don't know if you remember this, but probably when you, I think we were both principals at the time. 
And there is very few principals on Twitter. And basically, Twitter was a place for teachers to complain about how much their principals suck because there's hardly any principals there. I don't know. If, I don't know if you remember that. And it was just like, whoa, whoa, whoa! I don't do that. Like, what? Don't say all principals. Like, I don't do that. Yeah. And I, I remember this. And then you know, a lot of administrators started getting in there, and that maybe that changed a little bit, and maybe maybe not. Maybe I just didn't see it as much. But TikTok is now that place where it's a great place or I see a lot of teachers saying about how much their school and district leadership is so disconnected from the classroom. And like one of the, one of the things that I'm thinking about specifically is um, a lot of, and I don't know if this is the, 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 the up to date term, but like school discipline. And it's like our admin says this, but this is not happening. And there is a disconnect here. So they're saying something to the public, but it's not actually working in our classrooms. And I feel, you know, like that, what you just kind of talked about. And it's kind of interesting because like, I see that a lot on TikTok now. It reminds me of the early days of Twitter when, you know, it was like a lot of that happening. Now, I want to ask you about your book, uh, Navigating Leadership Drift. The first question, um, I want to ask you about this book. I feel sometimes we write the book that we needed. Like, would you say that would be, you know, like you would have benefited from this when you were administrator? Like, do you, do you feel that at all? Like, you know, part of it is you probably went searching for answers to kind of help you in, in what you're doing. Like, would you say that's kind of part of that process of, of writing the, the, the book with, uh, with Michael? I think it's a part of it, George. I think another part of it is, is that um, because like you, you, you get to meet so many leaders, um, mm -hmm. and, and in a, in the post COVID era, like I haven't been a principal since 2015. So that's a long time. And, and while it might not seem long time in sort of the, the educational trajectory, I think the, the demands that are on school leaders now have changed exponentially since I was a principal. And so I think part of the reason that I wrote the book with Michael is, is not so much for, for me as I'm watching people wilt and crumble under the pressure and we're losing the people that we can't afford to lose. Like the, the people, I almost liken it to the, and we're, we're from Canada, so we'll use a hockey analogy. Sure. Um, it's like having the 14 year old referee, the new referee on the ice, but for the, the sort of the peewee hockey game. Right. And you got the home fans screaming at the referee. You got the away fans screaming at the referee. You got the players screaming at the referee, the coaches screaming at the referee. And finally the referee says, you know what? I'm out. I'm out. Yeah. We have to be, this is why we wrote the book is because mm. right now I think a lot of people are saying I'm out and they're either, as we talked about earlier, quiet quitting, which is yeah. just showing up and going through the paces or they're actually leaving. And when you said earlier that, that, you know, people say, oh, you know, you don't really need a principal. This to me is what's super freaky is, is that hockey game does not happen without the referee. And I'm not likening a principal to a referee, but no. there's only so much that any one person can take in terms right. of getting beats from all over the place. So this book was really around how do we help leaders stay centered um, and, but also give them some practical tools to be able to sort through some of those things like you're seeing on, on TikTok or whatever, yeah. where, where, Hey folks, let's, let's create a common vision, not of discipline, but of what we want students to be, but then what are the inputs that we as educators have to do to make that happen not just the leader but all of us as a team so i think that's really the thrust for us writing was to try and just help let's not lose some of the great people that are out there right now it, it would be a tragedy to me yeah and you know i i i heard this statement the other day i can't remember i was i think i was listening to a sports podcast and when there's all these demands are being increased i think one of the first things that we have to kind of ask ourselves like what are we doing like in our schools, that's maybe causing some of these issues for ourselves. And the statement 100%. I heard, and sometimes I think that is, it's kind of like we're, 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 the, the statement I heard, and that it's like probably my, it's, it's the statement of the week is it's like you shoot yourself in the foot and then you wonder why you're walking with a limp. <laughs> That's a good one, hey? That is a good one. I, I like I I did the exact same thing as you. As soon as I heard it, I started laughing. I'm like, and so I'm like, is that 
is that happening in education and sometimes that we're like, we may be causing a little bit of issues for ourselves. And then we're overworked because of some of the issues that we've caused for ourselves. Like I'm sure there's obviously external stuff that's going on, right? There's always like politics. There's always like unrealistic expectations from politicians who have no clue about classrooms and all that stuff. But is there, is there some of that happening in schools where, Hey, like, like maybe we need to address the the root of some of the problems that we maybe be creating for ourselves. Is that happening? It is. You know, I think this is the the idea about when I talked earlier about this this concept of confronting and interrogating practice. Mm-hmm. And that those that sounds like uncomfortable terms, but truly at some point the Dr. Philism is how's that working for us? <laughs> so we kind of keep doing the same yeah. stuff over and over rather than saying what if we did a little root cause analysis? Let's take something like engagement. The first mm-hmm. thing that I think we need to do is, again, let's define what engagement looks like. And and uh, people say, you know, kids will be smiling and happy. I, I push that all off to the side because, right. George, you and I both know that there are times when I'm highly engaged and I'm not smiling. Yeah. And sometimes I'm not even happy. When I'm changing a spare tire in Winnipeg in the winter... <laughs> I am highly, highly engaged. I'm not super thrilled. It's a very Canadianism. Is it, I know. we got Because no one knows what that means in Florida. They've never seen no, snow before. No. But, but, you know, I think... So or the, Winnipeg. They, oh, gosh. <laughs> but, but the, you know, this idea, first of all, that, that before we start complaining about children or adults or principals, we need to have a common language about mm-hmm. what we mean. And, and so if we take something like engagement, you know, the, I, I would think about, okay, you know, all kids can start and complete the task in a classroom. All kids can tell us what they're doing, why they're doing it and how it connects to their world. If we start to lay out these definitions of engagement, we now have to then look at, so what would teachers do to make this happen. And I I think, again, if we want all kids to be able to start and complete tasks, I just use that as one small, tiny bit, just one. Mm -hmm. Then we have to look at, instead of saying, how do we do this? We should actually ask when kids want to start and complete tasks, what do we notice? It's relevant. It's engaging. It matters to them. Well, that starts to drive what we do as teachers. And as you're saying too often, we just look at one column, which is this is what we want kids to do without actually looking at the real column which is, right. and this is what we need to do to make right. that happen. And not just we as educators, but if we want educators, for example, leaders I hear, and you do that, you hear this too. I wish our teachers would take more risks. Hmm. First yeah. of all, if our teachers were taking more risks, what would we actually observe in the classroom? That's number question number one. And then number two is, if we want teachers to take more risks as a leader, What do I have to do to help make that happen? That's to me the questions, as you're saying, is we have to look at, first of all, what we want. But secondly, how do we contribute to this in a way so that we're actually solving the problem rather than complaining about the problem? Yeah. You know, you know, the and that's 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 something I'm really adamant about is when things are going wrong, the the one thing I can control is my own actions. Right. And you can be someone else can have done something to you, whatever, but like, what can I control? And the, the overwhelming that many educators are feeling, not just administration, obviously teachers too. They're like, we're so overwhelmed. And, and then I say, it might be because you have 84 different things you're trying to implement right now. Mm -hmm. We like maybe whittle this down because I think in innovators mindset, I asked the question, if I ask like a hundred people in your district, what are the three initiatives that you're working on in your district? Would I get three answers or would I get 300 answers? Right. And it's like, Oh, why are people so overwhelmed? It's like, because nobody knows what we're focusing on today and there's no clear, you know, we're always adding to the plate, never seemingly taken off. So I, I think that's, that's really, really powerful. Okay. So last question, navigating leadership drift, who is this written for? And what is what is the benefit of them reading this book? So the I think when people see leadership, they think right away it's superintendents, it's principals, and it really isn't. It's anyone, and I think as much as it's it's based in an educate with an educational sort of uh, background behind it, it's really for any leader. And but in in our context in schools, it's for someone who's even like a department head. Right. Someone who is a, a a middle level leader. It's all the way up to superintendents and beyond, and it's really written for for those folks who sit there. And I, 
read the read the you know I ask people read the introduction, and if the introduction doesn't grab you, you're you're good. But I think it will because it, what it says is it really talks a lot about um, how this the the struggle is real, mm-hmm. and and there are concrete solutions that we can do. You just mentioned like we've got so many initiatives going on, strategic plans that I work with now. I ask districts to have three or four, and three right. is better than four yeah. initiatives. Period. That's it. That's the maximum that we can focus on. And within those, really specific things that we hope to see—not a hundred things, but a couple of things. For the very reasons that you're saying, this book is about having people start to distill down to impact and then work outwards from there to action. So this is for any leader at any level who is feeling overwhelmed. And what they will get is hopefully they get a bit of entertainment because it is, it's, it's meant to be fun. Yeah. But I also hope they get a series of practical tools that will allow them to start to connect their leadership to impact. And that's that, you know, we talk a lot about collective teacher efficacy. I think efficacy is good for anyone, especially leaders, because my wonder is, is as the treadmill gets faster and faster for our leaders today, and we can all see it, and it's perceptibly happening over and over, as the treadmill gets faster, what are some of the tools that help me make sure that I can still keep up? So that's really who the book is for, and that's, I think, how we can get people to start to move through avoiding the drift and really staying focused on leading from the middle. Well, everyone listening to this podcast, I have learned a ton from Kale um, over the years, and I've learned so much in this podcast, and I love the way you you put stuff, and I know that the way you write is the the way you speak, which is, you know, very easy to listen to. Use some words that I don't know, but... <laughs> Again, the, I got my thesaurus here. I'm just flipping through them right now as we speak. No, but that is joking. Kale, is, Kale, like over the years, one of the things I really appreciate about you is how approachable you are in this because some of this stuff is very complex and you have a, a beautiful way of putting it in a way that's attainable. And I think that sometimes we make these solutions harder than they need to be. And I, I, I really appreciate that. So anyone, uh, make sure you connect with Kale. Uh, you can see his uh, Twitter handle there on Burke Learns. Uh, and you can connect with him. You'll see his uh, information down below. Below, check out, and he made a he made a guarantee here. So check out the introduction, and then you're gonna love the book. So uh, check out navigating leadership drift, observable impact on rigorous learning. Uh, thanks so much, Kale, for being on the podcast. It was awesome to connect with you today. Yeah, it was so much fun. Thanks again for having me, and uh, look forward to future conversations. Thanks, everybody. Have a wonderful day. 